Chapter 24 Other Great Marine Disasters West Indian Hurricane of 1867 1,000 Lives Lost Burning of the Cass Patrick 1874 476 Lives Lost Wreck of the Norge 1894 600 Lives Lost Ramming of the Cremathishare 1898 571 Lives Lost Burning of the General Slocum, 1904, 1,000 lives lost, other shipwrecks. Collision with icebergs has always been one of the most deadly of the dangers that confront the mariner. So well organized is this peril of the Newfoundland banks where the Labrador current in the early spring and summer months floats southward its ghastly erogacy and icy pinnacles detached from the polar caps that the government hydrographic offices of the maritime exchanges spare no pains to collate and disseminate the latest bulletins on the subject. That the floating iceberg ranks among the most dreaded of sea perils is illustrated by the fact that at cases where vessels have disappeared from in the sea, leaving no trace beyond to explain their fate mariners usually incline to the view that they have gone down with all on board after encountering one of these inanimate monsters of the deep. Such is believed to have been the doom of the fine old side wheel packet, the steamship Pacific of the Collins Line, which in 1850 was a transatlantic greyhound of her day and wrestled the speed supremacy for vessels flying the British flag. The Pacific was a Lilliputian craft compared with the Titanic of today, but she was the best of her kind when she steamed from New York in 1856, carrying 240 passengers bound for Liverpool. From that day to this, no trace of her has ever been found. Time and time again, her owners and also the government sent out steamships to hunt for the missing vessel, but not so much to derelict spar what a bottle scrawled was ever found, and to abase a conjecture as to the route by which the Pacific found her way into the port of lost ships. The loss of the White Star ship, the Noronic, is another of the sea's unsolved mysteries, which in lack of any evidence whatsoever is generally ascribed to collision with an iceberg. The Noronic is a fine new ship, having been commissioned only a year when on February 11, 1893, she steamed from Liverpool, eastward bound, with a crew of 54 men and a valuable cargo. As passengers, she also carried 10 wealthy cattle dealers who were returning from England to America. She never reached any earthly port and was never reported by any other craft. Several bottle messages were picked up months afterwards, all of which were pronounced superior by those best qualified to judge. An exhaustive investigation by the British authorities threw no light upon the mystery.
Chapter 25 Development of Shipbuilding Evolution of Water Travel Increases in Size of Vessels Is There Any Limit? Achievements in Speed Marvelous Provisions The origin of travel on water dates back to the very early period in human history when men beginning with the log, an inflated skin, the dugout canoe, and upwards to various methods of flotation, while paddle, the oar, and finally the sail served as means propulsion. This was far inland water travel, and many centuries passed before the navigation of the sea was dreamed of by adventurous mariners. The paintings and sculptures of early Egypt show us boats built by sawn planks, regularly constructed and moved both forth and backward by oars and sails. Next in turn come the Phoenicians, the most daring and enterprising of ancient navigators, who did not hesitate to bear the dangers of the open sea, and are said by Herodotus to have circumnavigated Africa as early as 604 BC. Starting from the Red Sea, they followed the east coast, rounded the Cape, and sailed north along the west coast to the Mediterranean, reaching Egypt again in the third year of this enterprise. These people were probably the discoverers of the art of sailing, and it was from them that the Greeks learned what they knew about navigation. It is probable that these ancient vessels were crude in construction and weak in structure, if we may judge from the fact that they carried heavy ropes, which they tied around the outside of the vessel in stormy weather. <clears throat> the Carthaginians, the Romans, come next in the history of shipbuilding, confining themselves chiefly to the Mediterranean and using oars as the principal means of propulsion. Their galleys ranged from one to five banks of oar. The Roman vessels in the first, Punic War, over 100 feet long and had 300 rowers, while they carried 120 soldiers. These ancient vessels were both used for war and for mercantile pursuits. The Genoese, being the first to build ships solely for mercantile purposes, they did not use sails until the beginning of the 14th century. Portugal was the first nation to engage in voyages of discovery using vessels of small size in these adventurous journeys. Spain, which soon would become her rival in this field, built larger ships and long held the lead in this for particular. Yet the ships with which Columbus made the discovery of America were of a size and character in which few sailors of the present day would care to venture far from again. Chapter 26, Safety and Life-Saving Devices The part played by wireless telegraphy, lifeboats and rafts, searchlights, submarine bells, watertight bulkheads, classes of marine disasters to be guarded against. Three dots, three dashes, three dots. The call, SOS, which in the International Congress at Berlin in 1907, fixed as a universal, universal danger call for all ships at sea and in distress. Maybe more than that, yet along the coast, it is relayed to naval stations, to agencies for great ocean-going tugs, from ship to ship, and from life-saving station to station, until the operator aboard the distressed ship catches the answer of cheer from some nearby liner, reversing her engines as the call comes and standing back in the fog for the disabled craft. <clears throat> it is history that clearly, early on Saturday morning of January 23, 1909, the lonely wireless station on a sand spit at Sansacon set in the northern end of the little seagirt island of Nantucket caught the CQD of the Marconi signal and the wireless jack bins of the sinking republic. Ten minutes later, 
the operator had finished the call from the station throughout the length of the Atlantic seaboard. CQD. Here, so, G. Meaning distress signal received at the Sig in concert wireless station. Go at once. The latitude and longitude of the sinking republic were wired at a quarter of an hour at the most after she had reeled back under the staggering blow from an Italian liner, Florida, and even as her holds were rapidly flooding. As far south as Charleston, the message penetrated and was answered and more than half a score of vessels within the radius of 200 miles of the sinking liner caught the words and sent their answer that they were racing for the distressed ship. To Charleston, Newport, Boston, Vineyard Haven, Woods Hole, and many other ports as far north as Halifax, the message traveled and was answered. Not 100 miles away from the sinking Republic, the swift liners Baltic, which is on the job as well, La Lorraine and Lucania, as many others sent their cheering words that they had reversed engines and would soon be there to stand by or give assistance. From Woods Hole, the revenge cutter Accusnit raced away from Boston, the revenue cutter Gresham put out and off Nantucket, the cruising cutters Mohawk and Seneca, hard by the wonderful, the wounded vessel, caught the message and schemed their way to her. All of this is a matter of history, all hung on a simple flash of dots and dashes, reproducing the dangers of the sea and saving millions of waiting persons from an agony of suspense. Chapter 27 Time for Reflection and Reforms Speed and luxury overemphasized. Space needed for lifeboats devoted to swimming pools and squash courts. Mania for speed records, complete use of dangerous routes, and prevents proper caution in foggy weather. Life more valuable than luxury. Safety more important than speed and aroused public opinion necessary. Adequate life-saving equipment should be compulsory. Speed regulations in bad weather. Cooperation in arranging schedules to keep vessels from within reach of each other. And legal regulations. It is a long time since any modern vessel of importance has gone down under nature's attack. And the general floating city of steel laughs at the wind and waves. She is not, however, proof against disaster. The danger lies in her own power, in the tens of thousands of horsepower with which she may be driven into another ship or into an iceberg, standing cold and unyielding as a wall of granite. In view of this fact, it is of the utmost importance that present-day vessels should be thoroughly provided with the most efficient life-saving devices possible. These would seem more important than fireplaces, squash carts, and many other luxuries with which the Titanic was provided with. The comparatively few survivors of the ill-fated Titanic were saved by lifeboats. The hundreds of others who went down with the vessel perished because there was no lifeboats to carry them until rescue came. These were sacrificed to a policy of parsimony and criminal willingness to take chances. The company preferred to give room to so many other things and to supply every form of luxury that the prime necessity of lifeboats fell short. Three-fifths of those in the doomed ship had to accept its fate and go down with it, only because there were no lifeboats to take them off. That ocean liners take these chances with their passengers through known to be well-informed is newly revealed and comes with a shock of surprise and dismay to most people. If boats are unsinkable, as well as fireproof, there is no need of any lifeboats at all. But no such steamship has ever been constructed. That it realized that lifeboats may be necessary on the best and newest steamships, proved by the fact 
that they carry them on board the law's requirements. But if lifeboats for one third of those on the ship are necessary, lifeboats for all on board are equally necessary. The law of the United States requires this, but the law and trade regulations of England do not. And these controlled the Titanic and caused the death of over 1,300 people. Chapter 29, The Senatorial Investigation. Prompt action of the government Senate committee probes disaster and brings out details, testimony of Ismay, officers, crew, passengers, and other witnesses. Public sentiment with regard to the Titanic disaster was reflected in the prompt action of the United States government. On April 17th, the Senate, without a dissenting vote, ordered an investigation of the wreck of the Titanic with particular reference to the inadequacy of life-saving boats and apparatus. The resolution also directed inquiry into the use of the Titanic, the northern course, over a route commonly regarded as dangerous from icebergs. Besides investigating the disaster, the committee was directed to look at the feasibility of international agreements for the further protection of ocean traffic. The Senate Committee on Commerce, in whose charge of investigation was placed, immediately appointed the following subcommittee to conduct gathering of evidence and the examination of witnesses. Senator William Alden Smith of Michigan, Senator Francis Newlands of Nevada, Senator Jonathan Bourne, Jr. of Oregon, Senator George C. Perkins of California, Senator Edward E. Burton of Ohio, Senator Fernanold, MCL, Summons of North Carolina, and Senator Duncan U. Fletcher of Florida. The Senate Committee began its investigation in New York on Friday, April 19th, the morning after the arrival of the Carpathia. Ismay, the first witness, came to the witness chair with a smile upon his face. He was sworn and then told the committee that he made the voyage on the Titanic only as a voluntary passenger. Nobody designated him to come to see the newly launched monster would have been would have behaved on the initial trip. He said that no money was spared in the construction and she was built on commission. There was no need for builders to slight the work for their own benefit. The accident had happened on Sunday night, April 14th. I was in bed and asleep, he said. The ship was not going at full speed, as had been printed, because full speed would be from 70 to 80 to 80 revolutions, and we were making only 75. After the impact with the iceberg, I dressed and went on deck. I asked the steward what the matter was, and he told me. Then I went to Captain Smith and asked him if the ship was in danger, and he told me he thought she was. Ismay, that he went on the bridge and remained there. He also said for some time, and then lent a hand in getting the lifeboats ready. He helped to get the women and children into the boats. Ismay said no other executive officer on a steamship company was on board, which practically made him the sole master of the vessel, the minute it passed beyond the control of the captain and his fellow officers. But Ismay, seeming to scent the drift of the questions, said that he never interfered in any way with the handling of the ship. Ismay was asked to give more particulars about his departure from the ship. He said, the boat was all ready to be lowered away and the officer called out if there were any more women and children to go or any more passengers on deck, but there was none and I got on board. Captain Restaurant's testimony. Captain Restaurant and the Carpathia followed Mr. Ismay. He said the first message received from the Titanic was that she was in immediate danger. I gave the order to turn the ship around as soon as the Titanic had given her position. I set a course to pick up the Titanic, which was 58 miles west of my position. I sent for the chief engineer, told him to put on another watch of stokers and make all speed for the Titanic. I told the first officer to stop all deck work, get out the lifeboats and be ready for any emergency. The chief steward and doctors of the Carpathia and I called to my office and instructed as to their duties. 
The English doctor was assigned to the first class dining room, the Italian doctor to the second class dining room, the Hungarian doctor to the third class dining room. They were instructed to be ready with all supplies necessary for any emergency. The captain told in detail the arrangements made to prepare the lifeboats and the ship for the receipt of the survivors. Weeps as he tells the story. Then tears filling his eyes, Captain Restoran said he called the purser. I told him, said Captain Restoran, I want to hold a service of prayer, thanksgiving for the living, and a funeral service for the dead. I went to Mr. Ismay. He told me to take full charge. An Episcopal clergyman was found among the passengers and he conducted the services. Titanic was a lifeboat. Captain Restaurant said that the Carpathia had 20 lifeboats of her own in accordance with the British regulations. Wouldn't that indicate that the regulations are out of date? Your ship being much smaller than the Titanic, which also carried 20 lifeboats, Senator Smith asked. No, the Titanic was supposed to be a lifeboat herself. Wireless failed. Why so few messages came from the Carpathia was going into. Captain Restaurant declared the first messages, all subsequently the same, were sent to the White Star Line, the Cunard Line, and the Associated Press. Then the first and second cabin passenger lists were sent, and the wireless failed. Senator Smith said some complaint he had heard that the Carpathia had not answered President Taft's inquiry from Major Butt. Captain Restoran declared a reply was sent, not on board. Captain Restoran declared he issued orders for no messages to be sent except upon orders from him and for official business to go first, then private messages from the Titanic survivors in order of filing. Absolutely no censure censorship was exercised, he said. The wireless continued working all the way in, the Marconi operator being constantly at the key. Guglielomo Marconi, the wireless inventor, was the next witness. Marconi said he was the chairman of the British Marconi Company. Under construction of the company, he said, operators must take their orders from the captain of the ship on which they are employed. Do the regulations prescribe whether one or two operators should be aboard an ocean vessel? Yes. On ships like the late Titanic and Olympic, there are two that are carried, said Marconi. The Carpathia, a smaller boat, carries one. The Carpathia's wireless apparatus is a short distance equipment. Titanic well equipped. Do you consider that the Titanic was equipped with the latest improved wireless apparatus? Yes, I should say that it had the very best. Did you hear the captain of the Carpathia say in this testimony that they caught this distress message from the Titanic almost providentially? Asked Senator Smith. Yes, I did, but it was absolutely providential. Is there any signal for the operator if he is not at his post? I think there is none, said Marconi. Ought it not be incumbent upon ships to have an, an operator always at the key? Yes, but ship owners don't like to carry two operators when they can get along with one. The smaller boat owners do not like the expense of two operators. Second officer testifies. Charles Herbert Lightower, second officer of the Titanic, followed Marconi on a stand. Mr. Lightower said he understood the maximum speed of the Titanic, as shown by its trial tests, to have been 22 to 22 and a half or 23 knots. Senator Smith asked if the rule requiring life-saving apparatus to be in each room for each passenger was complied with. Everything was complete, said Lightower. 16 lifeboats, of which four were collapsible, were on the Titanic, he added. During the test, he said Captain Clark of the British Board of Trade was aboard the Titanic to inspect its life-saving equipment. How thorough are these captains of the Board of Trade in inspecting ships, asked Senator Smith. Captain Clark is so thorough that we called him a nuisance. Titanic killed rapidly. After testifying to the circumstances under which lifeboats were filled and lowered, Light Tower continued, The boat deck was the only ten feet above the waterline when I ordered the sixth boat. When we lowered the first, the distance to the water was seventy feet. 
if the same course was pursued to life's to the starboard side as you pursued on the port and filling boats, how do you account for so many members of the crew being saved? asked Chairman Smith. I have inquired, especially and have found for that there every six persons picked up five were either firemen or stewards. Cottam tells his story. Thomas Cottam of Liverpool, the Marconi operator on the Carpathia, was the next witness. Cottam said that he absolutely was ready to retire Sunday night, having partially removed his clothes and was waiting for a reply to a message to the Parisian when he heard Cape Cod trying to call the Titanic. Cottam called the Titanic operator to inform him of the fact and received the reply, Come at once. This is a distress message. C.Q.D. What did you do then? I confirmed the distress message by asking Titanic if I should report the distress message to the captain of the Carpathia. How much time elapsed after you received the Titanic's distress message before you reported it to Captain Restaurant? About a couple of minutes, Cottam answered. Cottam recalled, when the committee resumed the investigation on April 20th, Cottam was recalled to the stand. Senator Smith asked the witness if he had received any messages from the time the Carpathia left the scene of the disaster until it reached New York. The purpose of this question was to discover whether any official had sought to keep back the news of the disaster. No, sir, answered Cottam. I reported the entire matter myself to the steamship Baltic at 10.30 o'clock Monday morning. I told her we had been to the wreck and had picked up as many of the passengers as we could. Cottam denied that we had sent any messages at all, that all passengers had been saved or anything on which such a report could be based. Cottam said he was at work Monday until Wednesday. He repeated his testimony on the previous day and said he had been without sleep throughout Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and until late Wednesday afternoon when he had been relieved by Bride. Did you or Bride send any messages declaring that the Titanic was being towed to Halifax? No, sir, said the witness, with emphasis. Marconi explains, In an effort to determine whether the signal CQD might not have been misunderstood by passing ships, Senator Smith called upon Mr. Marconi. The CQ, said Marconi, is an international signal which means that all stations should cease sending except the one using the call. The D was added to indicate danger. The call, however, now has been superseded by the universal call SOS. Bride on the Stand Harold S. Bride, the sole surviving operator of the Titanic, was then called. Bride said he knew the Frankfurt was near and the Carpathia when he called for assistance, but that he ceased his efforts to communicate with the former because her operator persisted in asking what is the matter, despite Bride's messages that the ship was in distress. Time after time, Senator Smith asked in varying forms why the Titanic did not explain its condition to the Frankfurt. Any operator receiving CQD in the position of the ship if he is on the job, said Bride, would tell the captain at once. Marconi again testified to the distress signals and said that the Frankfurt was equipped with Marconi wireless. He said that the receipt of the signal CQD by the Frankfurt's operator should have been all sufficient to send the Frankfurt to the immediate rescue. All appeals received. Under questioning by Senator Smith, Bride said that undoubtedly the Frankfurt received all the urgent appeals for help sent subsequently to the Carpathia. Investigation carried to Washington. The first witness when the investigation was resumed in Washington on April 22nd was P.A.S. Franklin, Vice President of the International Mercantile Marine Company. Franklin testified that he had no communication with Captain Smith during the Titanic's voyage, nor with his men except one cable from Southampton. Senator Smith then showed Mr. Franklin a telegram received by Congressman Hughes of West Virginia from the White Star Line dated New York, April 15th, and addressed J.A. Hughes, Huntington, West Virginia, as follows. Titanic, 
Proceeding to Halifax, passengers probably land on Wednesday, all safe, signed the White Star Line. Telegram a mystery. I ask you, continued the Senator, whether you knew about the sending of that telegram and by whom it was authorized, and from whom was it sent. I do not know, sir, said Franklin. Since I was mentioned at the ward off Saturday, we have had the entire passenger staff examined, and we cannot find out. Asked when he first knew that the Titanic had sunk, Franklin said that he knew at about 6.27 p.m. Monday. Mr. Franklin then produced a thick package of telegrams which he had received in relation to the disaster. About 20 minutes of two on Monday morning, he said, I was awakened by a telephone bell and was called by a reporter for some paper who informed me that the Titanic had met with an accident and was sinking. I asked him where he got the information. He told me that it had been come, came from a wireless from a steamship Virginian, which had been appealed to by the Titanic for aid. Mr. Franklin said he called up White Star Docks, but they had no information, and he had appealed to the Associated Press, and it was read, and it was read to him the dispatch from Cape Race advising him of the accident. I asked the Associated Press, said Mr. Franklin, not to send out the dispatch until we had more detailed information, in order to avoid causing unnecessary alarm. I was told, however, that the story had already been sent. The reassuring statements sent out by the line in the early hours of the disaster next were made the subject of inquiry. Tell the committee on what you base those statements, Mr. Smith asked. We base them on reports and rumors received at Cape Race by individuals and by the newspapers. They were rumors, and we could not place our finger on anything authentic. First definite news. At 6.20 or 6.30 Monday evening, Mr. Franklin continued a message was received telling the fateful news, but the Carpathia reached the Titanic and found nothing but boats and wreckage. That the Titanic had floundered at 2.20 a.m., in what 41.16 degrees north by 50.14 degrees west that the Carpathia picked up all the boats and had on board about 675 Titanic survivors, passengers, and crew. It was a terrible shock that it took me several moments to think what to do. Then I went downstairs to the reporters. I began to read the message, holding it high in my hand, I had read only to the second line which said that the Titanic had sunk, that there was not a reporter left. They had, were so anxious to get to the telephones. Safety Equipment The Titanic's equipment was in excess of the law, said the witness. It carried its clearance in the shape of a certificate from the British Board of Trade. I might say that no vessel can leave a British port without a certificate that is equipped to care for human lives aboard in case of of an accident. It is the law. Do you know of anyone, any officer or man, or any official whom you deem could have been held responsible for the accident and its attendant loss of life? Positively not. No one thought such an accident could happen. It was undreamed of. I think it would be absurd to try to hold some individual responsible. Every precaution was taken, that the precautions were of no avail and a source of deep sorrow, but the accident was unavoidable. Fourth Officer Testifies J.B. Boxhall, the fourth officer, was then questioned. Were there any drills or any inspection before the Titanic sailed? Both, said the witness. The men were mustered and lifeboats lowered in the presence of the inspectors from the Board of Trade. How many boats were lowered? Just two, sir. One on each side of the ship? No, sir. They were both on the same side. We were lying in dock. The witness said he did not know whether the lowering tackle ran free or not on that occasion. In lowering the lifeboats at the test, did the gear work satisfactory? So far as I know... In lowering a lifeboat, he said, first the boat has to be cleared, chocks knocked down, and the boat hangs free. Then the davits are screwed out of the ship's side, and the boat is lowered. At the time of the test, all officers of the Titanic were present. 
Boxhall said that under the weather conditions experienced at the time of the collision, the lifeboats were supposed to carry 65 persons. Under the regulations of the British Board of Trade, in addition to the oars, they were in the lifeboats water breakers, water dippers, bread, balers, masts, and sail and lights and supply of oil. All of these supplies, said Boxhall, were in the boats when the Titanic left Belfast. He could not say whether they were in the vessel when it left Southampton. Now, repeated Senator Smith, suppose the weather was clear and the sky unruffled, as it was at the time of the disaster, how many would the boat hold? Really, I don't know. It would depend largely on the people who were to enter. If they did as they were told, I believe each boat could accommodate 65 persons. Boxhold testified to the sobriety and good habits of the superior and brother officers. No trace of damage inside. Boxhall said he went down to the steerage and inspected all the decks in the vicinity of where the ship had struck, found no traces of any damage, and went directly to the bridge and so reported. Carpenter found leaks. The captain ordered me to send a carpenter to sound the ship but I found a carpenter coming up with the announcement that the ship was taking water. In the mail room, I found mail sacks floating about while the clerks were at work. I went to the bridge and reported, and the captain ordered the lifeboats to be made ready. Boxhall testified that the captain Smith's orders. He took word of the ship's position to the wireless operator. What position was that? 41, 46 north, 50, 14 West. Was that the last position taken? Yes, the Titanic stood not far from where she sank. After that, Boxhall went back to the lifeboats where there were many men and women. He said they had been provided with life belts. Distress rockets fired. After that, I was on the bridge most of the time sending out distress signals, trying to attract the attention of boats ahead. I sent up distress rockets until I left the ship. To try to attract the attention of a ship directly ahead, I had seen her lights. She seemed to be meeting us and was not far away. She got close enough, she was seemed to me, to read our Morse electric signals. Suppose you had a powerful searchlight on a Titanic. Could you not have thrown a beam on a vessel and have compelled her attention? We might. H.J. Pittman, the third officer of the ship, was the first witness on April 23rd. By a series of searching questions, Senator Fletcher brought out the fact that when the collision occurred, the Titanic was going at the greatest speed attained during the ship, even though the ship was entering the Grand Banks and had been advised of the presence of ice. Frederick Fleet, a sailor and lookout man on the Titanic, followed Pittman on the stand. Fleet said, he had five or six years experience at sea and was out looking on the oceanic prior to going on a titanic he was in the crow's nest at the time of the collision fleet stated that he had kept a sharp lookout for ice and testified to seeing the iceberg and signaling the bridge fleet acknowledged that if he had been aided by his observations by good glass he probably could have spied the berg into which the ship crashed in time had warned the bridge to avoid it Major Arthur Peachin of Toronto, a passenger who followed fleet on the stand, also testified to the much greater sweep of vision afforded by binoculars, and as a yachtsman, he had believed the presence of the iceberg might have been detected in time to escape the collision, had the lookout men been so equipped, had asked for binoculars. It was made to appear that the blame was being, without glasses, did not rest with the lookout men. Fleet said they had asked for them at Southampton and were told they were none for them. One glass and a pinch would have served in a crow's nest. The testimony before the committee on April 24th showed that the big steamship was on the verge of the field of ice 20 or 30 miles long, if she had not actually entered it when the accident occurred. The committee tried to discover whether it would add to human safety if the ships were fitted with searchlights so that at night objects could be seen at great distances. The testimony so far along this line had been conflicting. Some of the witnesses thought it would be no harm to try it, but they were all asked skeptical as its value. 
as an iceberg would not be especially distinguishable because its bulk is mostly below the surface. One of the witnesses said that much dependence is not placed upon the lookout and that those lookouts who use binoculars constantly found them detrimental. Harold G. Lowe, fifth officer of the Titanic, told a committee and his part in the struggle of the survivors for life following the catastrophe. The details of this struggle have always already been told in a previous chapter. Authorized to sell story. In great detail, Marconi, on April 25th, explained the operations of his system and told how he authorized Operator Bride of the Titanic and Operator Cottom of the Carpathia to sell the stories of the disaster after they came ashore. In allowing the operators to sell their stories, said Marconi, there was no question of suppressing or monopolizing the news. He had done everything he could, he said, to have the country informed as quickly as possible of the details of the disaster. That was why he was particularly glad for the narratives of such important witnesses as the operators to receive publication, regardless of the papers that published them. He repeated the testimony of Cotton that every effort had been made to get legitimate dispatches ashore. The cruiser Chester, he said, had been answered as fully as possible, though it was not known at the time that the queries came from the President of the United States. The Salem, he said, had never got in touch with the Carpathia operator. Senator Newlands suggested that the telegrams, some signed by the name of Mr. Samus, and some with the name of Marconi, directing Cotton to keep his mouth shut and hold out for four figures on his story. He was sent only as the Carpathia was entering New York Harbor, and there were no longer need for sending official or private messages from the rescuing ship. There had been an impression before, he said, that the messages had been sent to Cotton when the ship was far at sea when they might have meant that he was to hold back messages relieving the anxiety of those on shore. Ernest Gill, a donkey engineman on the steamship Californian, was the first witness on April 26th. He said that Captain Stanley Lord of the Californian refused later to go to the aid of the Titanic and the rockets from which could be plainly seen. He says the captain was appraised to these signals but made no effort to get up in steam to go to the rescue. Californian was drifting with a foe. So indigent did be he become, said Gill, as he endeavored a recruit committee of protest from among the crew, but the men failed him. Captain Lord entering a sweeping denial of Gill's accusations and read from the California's log to support his contention. Cyril Evans, the California's wireless operator, however, told of hearing much talk among the crew, who were critical of the captain's course. Gill, he said, told him he expected to get $500 for his story when the ship reached Boston. Evans told of having warned the Titanic only a brief time before the great vessel crashed into the berg of the sea was crowded with ice. The Titanic's operators, he said, at the time were working with the wireless station at Cape Race. They told him to shut up and keep out. Within a half hour, the pride of the sea was crumpled and sinking. Members of the committee who examined individually the British sailors and stewards of the Titanic's crew prepared a report by their investigators for the full committee. The testimony was ordered to be incorporated in the record of the hearings. Most of this testimony was but a repetition of experiences similar to the many already related by those who got away in the lifeboats. On April 27, Captain James H. Moore of the steamship Mount Temple who hurried to the Titanic in response to wireless calls for help, told of the great stretch of field of ice which held him off. Within his view from the bridge, he discerned, he said, the strange steamship, probably a tramp from Oris and a schooner, which was making her way out of the ice, the lights on the schooner, he thought, probably were those seen by the anxious survivors of the Titanic, in which they were frantically trying to reach help. Women at the Hearing Weep. Stuart Crawford also related a thrilling story in regard to loading the lifeboats with women first. He told of several instances that came under his observation of women throwing their arms around their husbands and crying out that they would not leave the ship without them. 
The apathetic recital caused several women at the hearing to weep, and all within earshot of the steward's story were thrilled. Andrews was brave. Stories that Mr. Andrews, the designer of the ship, had tried to disguise the extent of danger were absolutely denied by Henry Samuel Etches, his bedroom steward, who told the committee how Mr. Andrews urged women back to their cabins to dress more warmly and put on life belts. The steward, whose duty was to serve Major Butt and his party, told how he did not see the Major at dinner that evening in a disaster when he was dining with a private party in the restaurant. William Burke, first class steward, told a serving dinner at 7 15 o'clock that Mr. and Mrs. Strauss and Mr. Later, Strauss' refusal to leave her husband was again told to the committee. The bedroom steward told of a quiet conversation with Benjamin Guggenheim, Senator Guggenheim's brother, after the incident and shortly before the Titanic settled to the plunge that was to be its death. On April 29th, Marconi produced copies of several messages which passed between the Marconi office and the Carpathia in an effort to get definite information of the wreck of the survivors. Marconi and F.M. Samus, chief engineer of the American Marconi Company, both acknowledged that a mistake had been made in sending messages to Bride and Cottom on board the Carpathia, not to give out any news until they had seen Marconi and Samus. The Senatorial Committee investigating the Titanic disaster had served several good purposes. It has officially established the fact that all nations are censurable for insufficient antiquated safety regulations on ocean vessels and has emphasized the imperative necessity for united action among all maritime countries to revise these laws and adapt them to changed conditions. The committee reported its findings as follows. General conclusions. No particular person is named as being responsible. Throw attention is called to the fact that on the day of the disaster, Three distinct warnings of ice were sent to Captain Smith. J. Bruce Ismay, managing director of the White Star Line, is not held responsible for the ship's high speed. In fact, he is barely mentioned in the report. Ice positions so definitely reported to the Titanic, just preceding the incident, located ice on both sides of the lane in which she was traveling. No discussion took place among the officers. No conference was called to consider these warnings. No heed was given to them. The speed was not relaxed. The lookout was not increased. The supposedly watertight compartments of the Titanic were not watertight. Because of the non-watertight condition of the decks, they were transverse bulkheads where they ended. The steamship Californian, controlled by the same concern as the Titanic, was nearer the sinking steamship than 19 miles reported by her captain and her officers and crew saw a distress signal of the Titanic and failed to respond to them in accordance with the dictates of humanity. International us usage of the requirements of law. Had assistance been promptly offered, the California might have had the proud distinction of rescuing the lives of the passengers and crew of the Titanic. The mysterious lights of the unknown ship seen by passengers on the Titanic undoubtedly were the Californian less than 19 miles away. Eight ships, all equipped with wireless, were in the vicinity of the Titanic, the Olympic furthest away at 512 miles. The full capacity of the Titanic's lifeboats was not utilized because while only 700, 705 persons were saved, the ship boats could have carried 1,176. No general alarm was sounded, no whistle blown and no systematic warning was given to the endangered passengers, and it was 15 or 20 minutes after the collision before Captain Smith ordered the Titanic's wireless operator to send out distress messages. Titanic's crew were meagerly acquainted with their positions and duties. In an accident, and only one drill was held before the maiden trip, many of the crew joined the ship only a few hours before she sailed and were in ignorance of their position until the following Friday. Many more lives could have been saved had the survivors been concentrated in a few lifeboats, and had the boats thus released returned to the wreck for others. 
The first official information of the disaster was a message from Captain Haddock of the Olympic, received by the White Star Line at 6.16 p.m., Monday, April 15th. In the face of this information, a message reporting the Titanic being towed to Halifax was sent to Representative J.A. Hughes at Huntington, West Virginia at 7.51 p.m. that day. The message was delivered to the Western Union office in the same building as the White Star Line offices. Whoever sent this message, says the report, under the circumstances is guilty of the most reprehensible conduct. The wireless operator on the Carpathia was not duly vigilant in handling his messages after the incident. The practice of allowing wireless operators to sell this story should be stopped. Recommendations. It is recommended that all ships carrying more than 100 passengers shall have two searchlights. That a revision be made of the steamship inspection laws of foreign countries to conform to the standard proposed in the United States. That every ship be required to carry sufficient lifeboats for all passengers and crew. That the use of wireless be regulated to prevent interference by amateurs and that all ships have a wireless operator on constant duty. Detailed recommendations are made as to watertight bulkhead construction on ocean-going ships. Bulkheads should be so spaced that any two adjacent compartments of the ship might be flooded without sinking. Transverse bulkheads forward and aft of the machinery should be continued in watertight to the utmost continuous structural deck, and this deck should be fitted watertight. End of Project Gutenberg Extent of Sinking of the Titanic.